This is the course in translational research and clinical oncology. It's called TRACO for short. We have a lot of registrants this year. We went over our 150 limit, um, but people, they can come to the lecture here or in Frederick, and they can also watch the lecture live at the NIH videocast. And then two days after the lecture, it's actually archived, so you can watch it on the uh, uh, video cast anytime, any place. So <coughs> there's no excuse to miss a lecture. My office is up at Shady Grove, but I come down and do some research in Building 10. And then on our organizing committee, we have Erwin Arias. He's famous for the demystifying medicine class, which is in the spring. And that covers many different types of diseases, whereas we focus just on cancer. And so we have <coughs> Lubya Vodikovska and Ferrazia. They help uh, organize the lectures. And Jonathan Wiest is my boss, so he pays the bills for all the video casts. And then we have 13 lectures over a uh, 13 weeks of lecture, two hours, two lectures per week. And we start out today. Usually our lectures are on Monday, but as you know, yesterday was Labor Day. So we have the lecture today on a Tuesday, September 3rd. And then uh, September 16th and 30th are on Mondays. And then October 7th is a Monday. But then October 17th is actually a Thursday because that Monday is Columbus Day, which is again another federal holiday. And then October 21, 28, November 4 are Mondays. October 24th is a Thursday. November 12th is a Tuesday because the Monday is Veterans Day, uh, not get a federal holiday. And then we close out on Tuesdays, we end on December 2nd. So in terms of topics, there's four pillars for cancer therapy. Uh, one of which is chemotherapy. And Yves Pommier talks about topoisomerase inhibitors, which is a chemotherapeutic agent used in many types of cancers. And then another uh, pillar of cancer therapy is radiation oncology. And we have Liz Nichols from the University of Maryland Medical Center lecturing on that. And then a rising emphasis is on uh, stimulating the immune system. In cancer, many types of cancers, they're masked from the immune system. So the cancers aren't able to detect them. But if you take off the mask with immune checkpoint inhibitors, then they become sensitive to immune therapy. This is especially prominent in prostate cancer, but it also works in lung cancer. And then if the uh, tumors are very small, stage one, they can be removed surgically we have Jill Smith from Georgetown University lecturing on clinical trials on September 16th. So then in types, uh, in terms of different types of cancer that we emphasize, John Schiller today is going to emphasize cervical cancer. And Tina Nunziata is going to be discussing ovarian cancer. Ravi Madan is going to be talking about prostate cancer. And Farazia is going to be talking about breast cancer and childhood cancers. Uh, Del Rivero is going to be discussing that. That's a new emphasis at NCI. And then we have lung cancer lectures, November 4th, November 12th. And we close out with a lecture on pancreatic cancer by Perouad Hussain. But in terms of cancers, uh, at N NIH, what we try to do is emphasize precision medicine. So if a person has cancer, they do a genetic analysis of the tumor, 
see what genes are mutated, and then in turn that dictates the therapy. So in terms of the course, it's open, the price is right, it's free. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, unfortunately, the course is filled now in terms of registration, we're at our 150 limit. But if any of you are determined to get in, you should see me after lecture and I'll have you fill out a form. And then a unique feature of this class is it's not just lectures, but you can attend tumor boards where they discuss case reports. And you can also visit core facilities. So I'll be organizing this in the next week or two, and you'll all be getting an email so that you can sign up to visit the tumor boards or the core facilities if you so like. And <clears throat> the course, at the end, we do have a uh, multiple guest examination. There's one question from each of the 26 lectures. And if you get 70% of the answers correct, then you qualify for a course uh, certificate signed by the director. So that's about it for the organization. Are there any questions on the course organization? Yes. Well, we, yeah, we'll be discussing that briefly today, but uh, that's certainly an important cancer, uh, but we can't cover everything. So what we try to do, uh, we're not uh, certified this course, so we try to go with the most current topics that are making advances. And right now in cancer, that's immunology. And so we have a lecture on uh, immune therapy, and we also have a lecture uh, on the CAR T cells. Any other questions? Okay, so now we'll get into the uh, introduction. And we seem to have lost a slide. But on your handout, you'll see that the next slide just gets into the number of cases of cancer. And so the four big cancers in the US are lung cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. So total, these uh, can cause about 600,000 cases a year. And total in the US, there's 1.3 million cases of cancer diagnosed each year. And about half of these people die. And with lung cancer, 157,000 out of 171,000 die. So that tells you it's a very difficult cancer to treat. With colon cancer, there are some effective treatments. 57,000 people die per year. There's 147,000 diagnosed with colon cancer. But the Best therapy is for breast cancer and prostate cancer. For breast cancer, uh, there's 211,000 cases per year, about 20% die. And in prostate cancer, there's 220,000 cases and about 15% die. So lung, colon, breast, and prostate account for about half of the deaths of the cancers. And then in this slide, we show that cancers which are important, uh, but they kill less on the order of 10 to 30,000 per year. And so we have pancreatic cancer, which is very difficult to treat. And Perez Hussain will be lecturing on this later. Um, we have ovarian cancer, which is very difficult to treat. And Tina Nunziata will be lecturing on that. And in brain cancer, Glioblastoma is very difficult to treat in cancer risk. Um, alcohol certainly is a risk for cancer. So alcohol causes head and neck cancer, and it also causes liver cancer. And asbestos, this was commonly used in the 1980s as insulation material in buildings. And so asbestos causes mesothelioma of the lung. Diet is also a factor. 
So in Asia, they eat a lot of pickled fish. And as a result, they have a high incidence of stomach cancer. Familia factors, such as in uh, breast cancer, uh, the BRCA1 gene is mutated in Ashkenazi Jewish women. And so they have a high incidence of breast cancer. Obesity is also a factor. So obesity causes endometrial cancer, liver cancer, gastric cancer, kidney cancer. Ionic radiation, such as the atomic bomb in Japan in the 1940s caused a numerous cases of leukemia. Tobacco, as you all know, is uh, associated with lung cancer. UV radiation is associated with melanoma and viral factors, which John will be talking about later today, are associated with cervical cancer. Okay, so we're first going to focus on lung cancer and there's about 45 million current smokers and 45 million ex-smokers in the US. So people get addicted to smoking because of the nicotine. And the problem is even when you stop smoking, you're still at high risk of getting lung cancer for about 10 years. So even when you stop smoking, uh, you can still get lung cancer. It's just with time the risk of getting that declines dramatically. So there's many uh, chemicals in cigarette smoke, such as polyaromatic hydrocarbons. We have uh, NNK, ethyl carbamate is paint varnish. And then we see there's several metals, especially chromium and arsenic. So there's over a hundred different compounds in the cigarette smoke that can cause cancer. <coughs> but for the uh, polyadromatic hydrocarbons, the initial chemical is not a carcinogen. Rather, the chemical has to be oxidized to this BPDE, and then that's what forms adducts with the DNA, leading to DNA mutations. And in lung cancer, especially, the genes for P53 and KRAS are frequently mutated. So these are tumor suppressor genes. And when they don't function, the number of cancer cases goes up. So here you see benzpyrene. It's an aromatic hydrocarbon. We've got four six-membered rings. And then there's one ring with hydroxyl groups. And so uh, these hydroxyl groups get oxidized when we form the carcinogen. So here we have benzapyrene. It gets metabolized by P450 enzymes to an oxide, then epoxide hydrolase to a diol, then P450s again to the carcinogen BPDE. And then it reacts especially with guanines in the DNA. And ultimately, then, it can be further oxidized and excreted. So for the uh, carcinogens, they can be detoxified. And P450 enzymes catalyze the formation of the carcinogen. But phase two enzymes convert the oxygenated carcinogen into a highly soluble form in water that can be excreted then in the urine. So the DNA, if it's mutated and exceeds the rate of carcinogen deactivation, then you get cancer. So DNA addicts as well as intra and intrastrand DNA crosslinks are removed by nucleotide excision repair. But if this nucleotide excision repair isn't fast enough, then you get the cancer. So P53 then, it's a tumor suppressor gene. It mediates the G1 to S phase transition in the cell cycle. So the P53 normally drives programmed cell death, but 
it's increased the mutation along with P21 after DNA damage. And phosphorylated P53 is protective and increases the expression of BEX, killing the cancer cells. GAD45 results in a DNA repair. So P53, it's a good tumor suppressor gene, but when it gets mutated, it becomes inactive. And so the uh, codons that are uh, modified are an exon 5, exon 7, and exon 8. Not every guanine gets uh, mutated. And here you see the frequency of these mutations. This is uh, exon 5, exon 7, and exon 8. So in the cell cycle then, you're going from the G1 quiescent phase to G1 growth phase. And P53 uh, then mediates going from G1 to the S phase, where we get DNA replication. In G2, further proteins are synthesized. And then we go to the M phase, where the chromosomes get condensed and segregated. So we have the parent cell then going to form two daughter cells. And in cancer, their cells are trying to grow as fast as they can and stay in G1 phase as little as possible. And then in terms of uh, cell cycle enzymes, in the G1 phase, we have cyclin D1 predominating, as well as cyclin E. And then these interact with cyclin-dependent kinases. Cyclin D1 interacts with cyclin-dependent kinase 4 and 6. Cyclin E interacts with cyclin-dependent kinase 2. Then we get into the S phase, where cyclin A predominates along with cyclin-dependent kinase 2. In the G2 phase, cyclin A still predominates, but now it associates with cyclin-dependent kinase 1. And in the M phase, we have cyclin B interacting with cyclin-dependent kinase 1. So you see for each of the main phases, G1, S, G2, M, it varies as to which cyclin is there and which cyclin-dependent kinase is there. And these cyclin-dependent kinases, especially D, it's inhibited by various factors such as P21, 27, 57, 15, 16, 18, and 19. But the whole point of cancer cells is they just want to grow and spend little time in G1 phase, grow as rapidly as they can. So then in terms of tobacco smoke. Um, 10 years after smoking cigarettes, cells undergo hyperplasia and metaplasia. After 15 years of smoking, dysplasia can result. After 20 years, a carcinoma in situ can form. And after 25 years, a malignant cancer can form. So lung cancer, it takes a long time to form. Usually you only see it in adults over 50 years of age. And because it takes 25 years of carcinogen exposure to get it, there's many, many mutations that occur. And uh, lung cancer, uh, it has dozens and dozens of mutations, some of which are important. These are called driver mutations, and some of which just go along for the ride. These are called passenger mutations. So the normal lung, this is a cartoon. There's many normal cells, but then these cells start to grow in hyperplasia. In dysplasia, these cells start to lose their organization. And then when a carcinoma in situ forms, we're getting some malignant cells shown in green. And then when cancer forms, we get lots of green cells but they're no longer just confined to the lung. They can undergo metastasis to other organs. And lung cancer undergoes metastasis to the liver, lymph nodes, brain, and bone. So this is an example of a normal lung. 
And we see we have cells here and lots of cilia. And these cilia breathe and they give away CO2 and they absorb oxygen. And the oxygen gets into the bloodstream and goes to various organs in our body. So when we have hyperplasia, we see an abundance of cells now. There's still some cilia to exchange gases, but not as many. And then with dysplasia, the cells start to become disorganized and the cilia also becomes disorganized. And then when we get an adenoma, a carcinoma, we get malignant cells. This is an H and E stain. When you see malignant cells, you see lots of purple with a dark nuclei and less pink. And then with an adenoma, adenocarcinoma, you see lots of purple and less pink. And now we get organized structures of cells. So the cancer cells associate with each other. And the reason they do this is they give out growth factors. So if they come together locally, then they get a higher concentration of growth factors and they'll grow faster. So here's a cartoon again showing we have normal epithelial cells. Then tumor promoters, growth factors, will start to stimulate the growth of the cancer cells. And then we'll get a carcinoma in situ. And then this carcinoma in situ with further progression becomes malignant, shown in red, and it goes across into other organs through the blood or the lymph. So the tumors then, initially they form a carcinoma, but then when they get big, they have trouble getting oxygen and nutrients from the blood. So then the host sends in blood vessels and the tumors use that to get more oxygen and growth factors to grow. And then when the tumor cells have pretty much taken over the primary organ, then they'll undergo migration and basinid metastasis to other organs. And uh, when we're talking about cancer deaths, Almost all the cancer deaths are due to metastasis to other organs. So we mentioned tumor suppressor genes. We have P53 is an important one. Another one is the retinoblastoma gene. P16 we mentioned is an inhibitor of the cyclin-dependent kinases. Cyclin D1 is an enzyme that stimulates transitions from the G1 to S phase. And then we'll be focusing here on the EGF receptor as an oncogene. And another member that's related to it is called ERB2. This is prominent in breast cancer. The EGF receptor is prominent in lung cancer. And CMYK is a nuclear oncogene, uh, which is common in lung cancer. So if we're talking about the receptor tyrosine kinases for the EGF receptor, it's about 1,200 amino acids, and it's got four extracellular domains. Domains one and three are important in binding of the growth factor. It's got two structural domains, domains two and four. These are enriched in cysteine amino acids. And domain two is very important because the EGF receptor can form dimers. And domain two is responsible for the dimer formation. And you see in red, we have the tyrosine kinase domain. So when the EGF receptor is activated, it can phosphorylate tyrosine amino acids on various substrates. And we see the insulin receptor has a similar structure, except it's a dimer, not just a monomer. And it dimerizes through disulfide bonds. And we have other receptors, such as the FGF receptor. It's got two tyrosine kinase domains, but this squiggly green line indicates that it has immunoglobin domains on the extracellular surface. 
So for the EGF receptor, it's structurally related to the ERB2 receptor, the ERB3 receptor, and the ERB4 receptor. So the EGF receptor, it's got a receptor binding domain with an R, and it's got a kinase domain in orange with a K. And we see there's lots of ligands that combine to the EGF receptor. EGF, TGF alpha, amphiregulin, beta cellulin, heparin binding EGF, epiregulin. And similarly for the ERB4 receptor, it's got lots of ligands. New regulin two, new regulin three, hair regulins, beta cellulin. But the ERB2 receptor, which is prominent in breast cancer, is a little different because while it has a tyrosine kinase domain that's active, it doesn't have any ligand binding domain. But it can get tyrosine phosphorylated because it can form a heterodimer with the EGF receptor. So by itself, ERB2 can't do anything, but when it's with the EGF receptor, then it's very active. And a strange one is the ERB4 receptor because it's got a receptor binding site where it binds her regulins, but its kinase domain has very little activity. Yet the ERB3 receptor, it can form a heterodimer with the ERB2 receptor and it's very active. They both get tyrosine phosphorylated. So all you need is one receptor binding domain and one active kinase domain, and you've got cancer growing very rapidly. So the EGF receptor, we mentioned the outside, it's got 621 amino acids, crosses the membrane once, 24 amino acids. And then we have 541 amino acids on the intracellular side. And lysine 721 binds ATP. The phosphate gets transferred. And then it goes to a tyrosine amino acid and a protein substrate. But after it's tyrosine phosphorylated other things, then it will tyrosine phosphorylate itself at various amino acids, various tyrosines. So uh, TGF-alpha and EGF bind with high affinity. And with irapastin, we looked at this one ligand where TGF-alpha was covered to a toxin, PE38. It also bound with high affinity, and this actually killed cancer cells. And here's just a gel showing if you add uh, EGF to the EGF receptor, Here's the EGF receptor being tyrosine phosphorylated. It's around 170 kilodaltons. The phospholipase C gamma also gets tyrosine phosphorylated. It's about 148 kilodaltons. And PI3 kinase also gets tyrosine phosphorylated. It's about 115 kilodaltons. <clears throat> so then the EGF, it will tyrosine phosphorylate substrates phospholipase C gamma, PI3 kinase, as well as its at so. And then uh, about 15 years ago, they found that lung cancer EGF receptors were often mutated. And as a result, the tyrosine kinase activity was turned on even in the absence of a ligand. So uh, if the receptor is mutated at 858, a leucine instead of an arginine. Uh, it resulted in high tyrosine kinase activity. Or if there was a glycine at 718 instead of a cysteine, again, it was high tyrosine kinase activity. So what they do is they analyze the biopsy specimen of the tumor. And if they see these mutations, then they know that tyrosine kinase inhibitors are going to be effective. And these are small molecules, gefitinib and erlotinib. And they're currently used to treat lung cancer patients if they fail chemotherapy. So here we're looking at the EGF receptor, the tyrosine kinase domain. We see the mutation at 719. We see the mutation at 858. And also if you delete amino acids around 750, 
you'll turn on the tyrosine kinase activity. So then we're going to look at signal transduction with the EGF receptor. And the first pathway we're going to look at is called the MEK-ERK pathway. And so we see TGF alpha is binding to the EGF receptor. The EGF receptor is getting tyrosine phosphorylated. And if it forms a heterodimer with HER2, it's also getting tyrosine phosphorylated. And then as a result of signal transduction, we're phosphorylating, uh, we're turning on RAS, and RAF will phosphorylate RAF, which phosphorylates MEC which phosphorylates ERK. You think, wow, that's a lot of stuff going on. Well, it takes about 30 seconds. <laughs> it's very, very fast. These cancer cells want to grow. So all these pathways are designed to be very rapid so they stimulate growth. OK, so in non-small cell lung cancer, RAF, KRAS mutations are a problem. It's about in 20 to 30% of the patients. And there's no real good therapy yet for KRAS mutations. So that's why it's important to do the uh, genetic analysis to see what kind of mutations you're dealing with in the patient. So when RAS gets mutated, there's reduced GTP ACE activity resulting in RAS GTP, which is biologically active. And the mutations occur at codon 12. And in Frederick, they have a initiative up there to try to find new therapies for KRAS mutations. But there's nothing yet available in the clinic. So downstream of RAS is RAF. And this is a serine threonine kinase. And it gets mutated, especially in melanoma patients. Amino acid 600, if a valine in place of a uh, glutamate. <coughs> but here they've identified a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, a small molecule, PLX 4032, and they get a response rate of 81% in the patients. So both RAS and BRAF are driver mutations and in several types of cancer. So MEC doesn't get mutated, but they have lots of inhibitors for MEC. One is trimetinib. They're trying that in BRAF uh, naive patients. And another MEC inhibitor is selumetinib. And they're trying that with docetaxel, a chemotherapeutic, in KRAS mutant non-small cell lung cancer patients. So that's a work in progress. But the workhorse is downstream, and this is ERK. So ERK, when it gets phosphorylated, it goes into the nucleus where it regulates the expression of transcription factors such as FOS, June, or MIC. So ERK goes from the cytosol to the nucleus, and it alters gene expression. And here's a little cartoon showing we have an EGF receptor dimer. It's interacting with RAS at the plasma membrane, then RAS is phosphorylating RAF, which phosphorylates MEC, which phosphorylates ERK, which goes into the nucleus and alters gene expression, stimulating growth. And here's a cartoon showing the EGF receptor. It's been uh, crystallized. Its X-ray crystal structure is known. And so here we see four extracellular domains, one, two, three, and four. And then when we form a dimer, we mentioned that domains two uh, interact with one another. In a structural change then in the tyrosine kinase domain, so that we have increased enzymatic activity. <clears throat> a 
Okay, so uh, that's the growth pathway, the mech earth pathway. A second pathway is a survival pathway. So what happens is we want to try to kill cancer cells, but they have a way in which they can survive. And so they have this enzyme, PI3 kinase, and PI3 kinase can then cause phosphorylation of AKT, which can then activate mTOR, stimulating growth and metastasis. So uh, the PI3 kinase, it promotes cancer cell survival. It's got a catalytic subunit, 100 kilodaltons, and it metabolizes phosphatidyl inositol turnover. PIP2 goes to PIP3. And PI3 kinase, it's mutated in about a quarter of the breast, a quarter of the brain cancers, glioblastoma, a third of the colon cancers, and a quarter of the stomach cancers. It can be mutated at position 542, 545, or 1047, resulting in gain of enzymatic activity. So if you turn on PI3 kinase, you're going to increase cellular survival. And an enzyme which stops the phosphorylation caused by PI3 kinase is P10. It's phosphatase and tensin homolog. And it gets rid of the PIP3 and catalyzes it to PIP2. But it's mutated in about 13% of the breast cancer patients. And there's also loss of heterozygosity. So when P10 is in, inactive then, you get more PIP3, and this is going to stimulate more cancer cell survival. AKT or protein kinase B is downstream, and it's a kinase which gets phosphorylated at serine 473, and it promotes cellular survival by inactivating uh, BAD and caspase 9, preventing apoptosis of cancer cells. And AKT is mutated in about 5% of the breast cancer. 6% of the colon cancer. And there's all sorts of inhibitors for AKT that are in clinical trial, but this is sort of a work in progress. And mTOR is downstream of AKT, and it's again a serine threonine kinase, and it decreases autophagy, a lysosome dependent degradation pathway. So they've try, they're trying also to use inhibitors of mTOR to see if that will uh, affect cancer growth. So this is a little cartoon for lung cancer. And we see that in lung cancer, about 30% of the biopsy specimens, 30% of the patients have KRAS mutations. That's not good because we don't have any drugs really to treat that yet. The EGF receptors mutated in about 20%, but we do have tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are active. And another thing they found, uh, Stephanie Goff will be lecturing on immune checkpoint inhibitors. And they're effective in about 20% of the lung cancer patients. And you might think, well, 20% isn't a good number. But when you got 150,000 dying a year, saving 20% means you're saving 30,000 people. That's a big number. So another thing that gets mutated is ELK. It's again a receptor tyrosine kinase, and we mentioned about HER2 as well. But note all the different things that are mutated in lung cancer, at least a dozen, but then there's about 40% of the cases that they don't know about yet. So there's still a lot of other things left to discover that are mutated in lung cancer. And so this is how we do molecular medicine. This was a protocol uh, from MCI. And so we have a biopsy specimen, you get it. You do a genetic analysis of the patient. 
If it's got an EGF receptor mutation, you treat the patient with herlotinib, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. If it has a RAS, RAP, or MEK mutation, you treat it with a MEK inhibitor. If it's got a P10, PI3 kinase, or AKT mutation, you treat it with a PI3 kinase inhibitor. If it's got an ERB B mutation, you treat it, treat it with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor named lapotinib. If it's got a KIP mutation, P, PDGF mutation, you treat it with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor sunitinib. And then you get into the unknown zone. But you assay the sample at the beginning of the treatment, you assay the sample at the end of the treatment, and you see how it compares. And this is just a cartoon showing that with receptor tyrosine kinases, they can activate themselves, but you also have G protein coupled receptors through a process called transactivation. They can activate the enzyme SARC, which then stimulates Protease, proteases, the atom and the MMP, and that causes conversion of pro-TGF alpha to TGF alpha, which is biologically active, which can then bind to the EGF receptor, and it can form a heterodimer with HER2. And it seems complicated. This whole process takes less than a minute because the cancer cells want to grow. They want to grow fast. So all these things are stimulated to occur very fast. So the problem is with the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that after a year, they start losing their response to a lot new. And the reason for this is cancer is a moving target. It's constantly changing. So one year, you can have, have a drug that works very well in the patient. The next year, the tumor's mutated into something else. So then the drug you were using no longer works. So cancer is a moving target. You've got to be on your toes to see what's going on. So after about a year, they found that 50% of the non-small cell lung pa cancer patients, the mutation in the EGF F receptor had changed to amino acid 790, a threonine replaced methionine. And here, this enzyme is no longer responsive to erlotinib. So now they're coming up with second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors, third generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors. The chemists are having a field day, making all these new drugs. So, cancer's a challenge. It's always changing. So you've got to change with it. Another example of this is CML patients. Uh, they're sensitive to the tyrosine kinase inhibitor Gleevec. And the patients get better when they're treated with this drug. And CML, it's not a mutation that occurs. It's a translocation between chromosome 9 and chromosome 22, resulting in the BCR able gene. And the tyrosine kinase is then turned on in this hybrid gene. But the hybrid gene is inhibited by Gleevec. So here we have chromosome 22 chromosome nine, we get a translocation. The, yellow, the five prime end of 22 joins with the three prime end of nine, forming the BCR able gene. And now it's translated into the BCR able fusion protein. And so here we're looking at the chromosomes. Here's chromosome nine, here's chromosome 22, and you see Chromosome nine, when it's mutated, it gets bigger. And chromosome 22, when it's mutated, it gets smaller. So this was initially just diagnosed based on a chromosomal analysis. And then the molecular biologists got busy and they figured it out. So there's always some side effects with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and there's often nausea, vomiting, edema, and especially rash, but these can all sort of be overcome. And 
after a year of Gleevec, initially 51 out of 53 patients were still doing well. Initially, 53 out of 54 responded. But over a five-year period, it, the response started to decrease. And so they found then that there was further mutations. And um, the additional mutation was at amino acid 315, a threonine replaced an isoleucine near the ATP binding site impairing Gleevec interactions. So now again, the chemists are busy with new drugs. Ponatinib, BCC 2036, a second generation drug. So in terms of tyrosine kinase inhibitors then, we mentioned for CML, the defect is in BCR able, and it can be treated with imatinib, and a new drug is dasatinib. For breast cancer, HER2 gets mutated, and it can be treated with Herceptin, which is a monoclonal antibody, or Lapatinib, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. For melanoma, BRAF gets mutated. This can be treated with PLX4032. For gastrointestinal stromer tumors, CKITS gets mutated. It can be treated with imatinib or sinitinib. And for non-small cell lung cancer, we mentioned the EGF receptor gets mutated. It can be treated with gefitinib or allotinib. So when you see nib at the end, that means it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. PLX4032 is also a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but Herceptin is a monoclonal antibody. So monoclonal antibodies now are also good drugs for cancer treatment. So we're getting to the end and we need to look at steps that we can take to prevent cancer. One is check your house for radon. So when I first moved to Maryland, I bought a house on a hilltop in Frederick County. And when I went to sell it, they went into the basement and they said, no can do. You've got too much radon in your basement. It's enough radon. It's equivalent to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. So to sell the house, I had to install a pump and it just blows fresh air into the basement and the bad air blows out. And that's actually quite common in the state of Maryland. You wanna check your house for asbestos. As I mentioned, when there was a lot of building in the 1980s, they used insulation that contained asbestos. Asbestos causes mesothelioma of the lung. So they no longer use it. But if you're in an old building, you just need to be careful. If someone comes in and tears out the walls, you better leave the room. <laughs> And some of the buildings here at NIH, unfortunately, are old, and they do have asbestos in the walls still. Take precautions at your workplace. So we mentioned about looking out for the walls. Check your community water system. It's amazing, but sometimes water gets polluted. You've all heard about lead in uh, the state of Michigan, Flint, Michigan, has lots of lead in the water. Well, some water systems, they have lots of uh, uh, asbestos and chromium. And we mentioned asbestos and chromium can cause lung cancer. So you wanna drink good water. You wanna avoid breathing polluted air. Again, some of the polluted air can have chromium in it, as well as uh, arsenic and these things are not good for you. And then you wanna protect your skin. If you're going out in the sun, you don't wanna get melanoma, so you wanna use uh, sunscreen to protect yourself. Don't breathe smoke. Um, that's initially how they discovered lung cancer, the chimney sweeps would get lung cancer because they go into the chimney and they have lots of soot and smoke. And you wanna exercise daily. 
My thing is bicycle riding. You see, I ride in the summer. I have a nice tan on my shoulder, on my arms and face. And uh, this weekend, we actually have what's called the Civil War Century Ride. So you go up to uh, Thermont and you ride in the Civil War battlefields like Gettysburg, sort of spooky. <laughs> you wanna avoid pesticides. Pesticides are known to cause prostate cancer. Eat lots of fruits and vegetables. We showed you that to get a carcinogen, a chemical has to be oxidized. Well, fruits and vegetables have a lot of reductants in them. So they reduce this oxidation of chemicals into carcinogens. You wanna reduce red meat consumption. Uh, excessive consumption of red meat can lead to certain types of cancer like colon cancer. You wanna eat fish, it's enriched in uh, omega-3 fatty acids, which prevent cancer. You wanna minimize eating fried foods, drink alcohol in moderation, avoid unnecessary x-rays, and reduce infections. So infections uh, cause inflammation, and that contributes to about 15% of the cancer cases. So finally, we have a couple of references, one Hanahan and Weinberg, Hallmarks of Cancer, another by Brian Drucker. This talks about the BCR table. And that's about it for my lecture. And the good news is the hurricane is weakening and it's moving north, so it's staying away from the Florida coast. So that's good news. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. No, no, P angiogenesis is a separate process. P53 is involved in the cell cycle. And so when it's active, it inhibits G1 to S transition. But when it's inactivated, then the G1 to S transition occurs very rapidly. It's just uh, the structural architecture. Hyperplasia means there's more cells in a particular area than normal, whereas metaplasia, the cells start to get disorganized. They don't recognize the cell borders. They start to clump together. Yes. Well, we can go look at this. Yeah, we can go look at it. So here's the cartoon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see any metaplasia. Yeah, metaplasia is it's in between hyperplasia and dysplasia. Okay, so here you see hyperplasia, the cells are still all arranged in a columnar. And in dysplasia, they're all totally disorganized. And metaplasia is somewhere in between. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we'll move on then to John's talk. John got a bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Then he went to another outstanding university, the University of Washington in Seattle and got a PhD. And then he came to the NIH in 1983, initially as a postdoctoral fellow, then a senior staff fellow, then a senior investigator, then a section head, 
and now he's an NIH Distinguished Investigator. He's won many awards, the most prestigious of which is the Lasker Award. He's going to talk on HPV and these cancers and vaccines to prevent them. John. Okay, so I'll mainly be talking to you about cervical cancer. I'll be talking to you about cervical cancer from the point of view of a virologist. So I'm not really an oncologist. I'm really at heart a virologist. But in this case, it's actually very appropriate because the understanding that a virus is a central cause of this cancer really makes cervical cancer unique. And that it's the only cancer that I can think of that we actually have the tools in place to eradicate it in your lifetime, maybe not my lifetime, but probably in most of your lifetime. And so one of the things I'll go over is, is what are those tools? Why do we think that this is actually possible? But then what are the impediments to actually reaching that goal? So no further ado. Is it this one? There we yeah. go. Okay, I got it. Yeah, this top is the light. Okay, got it. Okay, so just a little bit of, of general background about viruses and cancer. Overall, viruses cause an estimated 10% of cancer. And what you can see here, the leading cause is, is cervical cancer, uh, is, is HPV cancers, which is about 50% over 600,000 cases. And another interesting thing is that although HPV associated cancers predominate in females, actually a lot of the other ones, the hepatitis, um, Epstein-Barr and Kappa C sarcoma actually cause more cancers in men than they do in women. So overall, when we talk about HPV cancers worldwide, we really focus on cervical cancer for, for reasons that should be obvious from this slide because both in terms of the, the attributable fraction, which is almost 100%, and the actual number of cases per year, there's many more cases of cervical cancer um, worldwide than there are of these other cancers, which include anal, vulvar, vaginal, penile, and oral pharyngeal cancer, which is a particular subset of head and neck cancers. Now, the, the spectrum is actually quite different in the United States where you can see here, there's actually more oral pharyngeal cancers that are associated with HPV than there is cervical cancer. And this is a fairly recent trend. And the reason for this is twofold. First of all, we're doing a pretty darn good job at preventing cervical cancers by our cervical cancer screening programs, traditionally via the pap smear, and more recently by HPV DNA testing. And so that it's been estimated that we've prevented at least 80% of cervical cancers in the United States with these screening programs. We have a horrible incidence of cervical cancer. It'd be the leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States if we didn't have this screening program. And the other reason is that oral pharyngeal cancer, particularly among men, has been what's considered an epidemic. It's been increasing two to four fold in the last decade. And so because of this, really, we, we have to look at cervical cancer, oral pharyngeal cancer. Actually, this is the wrong slide. Here is the slide I want. So actually, it's good to have this slide in here. So this is, this is my old slide from earlier, from 2012, where you see this, where it's still less. And the, the same group recently came up with this data for 2019, where you can see now there's actually more oral pharyngeal cancer. I just updated this slide <laughs> a day or two ago because it was getting out of date. So you can see how oral pharyngeal cancer is moving up as the leading cause in the United States for HPV-associated cancer. I failed to mention that overall, worldwide, about 5% of all cancers are thought to be caused by HPV infection. So what is this virus that causes all these cancers? So it's a double-stranded DNA virus, about 8 kb genome. And it's got an early region that involves things involved in its replication, virus release, immune evasion, and then two genes that are preferentially expo expressed in cancer, which are called E6 and E7. And then it's got its virion structural proteins, which are called L1 and L2. Now, the virus is a non-enveloped icosahedral shell. It doesn't have an envelope um, like many viruses do. 
And it's actually very simple. It's made up of, of 72 pentamers of this major capsid protein, L1. And then L2 is sort of stuck in the middle of these capsomeres. L2 is absolutely required for infection. But as you'll see in a minute, it's not required for making the vaccine or inducing antibodies to the, the authentic virus. So the virus has a really unique um, lifestyle. And the lifestyle is basically evolved to evade immune evasion. The only place this virus can produce its virus is in a stratified squamous epithelia. And it's tricky. So what it first does is it gets down into the basal layer here, and it has very low levels expression of, of any of the viral gene products. None of the virion proteins, uh, capsid proteins, are expressed at all. The genome replicates autonomously. And then it cues into terminally differentiated signals. And it's only when it's this upper layer of the epithelium, which isn't under close immune surveillance, that it starts making these very immunogenic virion proteins and, and makes a lot of its gene products. This is just an example of what, it, what a high-grade dysplasia looks like. You can see it's very inapparent, okay? If you look inside, though, what you'll see is that there's a lot of proliferation of cells here. Um, and in this case, this is probably an intermediate grade because there's still this expression of proteins associated with uh, virion production. This is what a normal epithelium looks like, and, and um, MCM is sort of a marker of cells that have the ability to divide. You can see we have cells that can divide much higher up in the epithelium. And one of the interesting things about HPV-associated cervical cancer is that almost all of them occur at one place in the female reproductive tract, which is called the transformation zone, where there's a transition between simple columnar epithelial of the endocervix and um, stratified squamous epithelia of the ectocervix. Cervix. And this is an area where we talk about metaplasia. This is where this transformation between the two forms is occurring. And for reasons that are not entirely understood, this is where almost all cancers arise. For anal cancer, it's the same way. It occurs at a transformation zone. Um, vaginal can uh, infections are actually quite common with this, certainly as common as, as cervical infections, but vaginal vulvar cancers are relatively uncommon because there isn't a transformation zone in that tissue. And so one of the interesting things for the future is to really understand what is it about these cells right at this trans transition zone that allow them to be susceptible to HPV-induced carcinogenesis. So the model for this type of carcinogenesis is as follows. So the one of the oncogenes, E7, induces aberrant proliferation. It says signals to divide for cells that don't normally want to divide. But those kind of signals normally induce apoptosis, okay? But so it has another protein, E6, which inhibits this apoptotic process. And together, they can lead to immortalization, genomic instability, and cellular transformation. So one of the big questions is, well, why would a virus have oncogenes? And first of all, it's important to note that, car that cancer is a very uncommon outcome of HPV infection. This is true for the other um, virusly associated cancers. The, the virus does not want to evolve to cause cancer. Matter of fact, for HPV, it's a dead end because cancers are so de-differentiated that they, can't, they can no longer make virion. But the reason it wants to have, quote, oncogenes is because it's got a problem. It wants to replicate its genome in terminally differentiating cells that aren't themselves replicating. So it has to fool the cell to turn on its DNA replication machinery in these terminally differentiated cells. And that's what this E7 and E6 does. Now, both E6 and E7 interact with a, a surprisingly number of, of cellular proteins. They don't have enzymatic activity. They, they regulate the activity of cellular proteins. And this is something that was actually very surprising when people have realized how many different proteins they interact with. I just want to talk about a couple of the major interactors. And one player is this RB, which, which Terry already talked about. Normally, RB interacts with E2F and inhibits cyclin A and cyclin E in, in S phase entry. But E7 binds RB and uh, it activates it and causes some of its degradation, which then activates the cell cycle. It also activates with DNA repair machinery, ATM and ATR, which can lead to um, 
genomic instability and also with interferon response elements that inhibit apoptosis. And E6 interacts with another of the major tumor suppressor proteins that um, Terry talked about, and it binds P53 and induces the ubiquitin dependent degradation. Um, it also has a number of different other activities I'm not going to talk about, but one of the interesting ones is that it, it can also um, activate TERT and lead to immortalization. So the timeline for cervical cancer and, pro and progression, uh, cervical infection and progression to cancer is as follows. So lifetime incidence of HPV infection is over 80%. Having a genital HPV infection in your life is almost synonymous with being sexually active. Very, very common. But most of the infections go away spontaneously, presumably through an immune-mediated mechanism, which then eliminates risk of, of, of cancer progression. So it's really persistent infection by specific high-risk types. We're talking mostly about 16 and 18, because they cause about 70% of cervical cancer and 90% of the other cancers. That is really the single most important risk factor for getting cervical cancer. Without having an HPV infection, you almost have no risk of getting cervical cancer, okay? It's by far the dominant risk factor. And these infections are, are acquired quite rapidly after becoming sexually active. This is just data from the UK in the United States where after initiating sexual activity, within about two years, almost half of the young women in these studies had acquired a genital HPV infection. This is why it's very important when we start talking about the vaccine that, that women and men get vaccinated before they become sexually active. Because once they get the infections, then the vaccine doesn't work, at least for the types that they have. So really, we talked about there's two arms for prevention of cervical cancer. And the most established arm is pap screening, or now, as I mentioned, DNA testing, to evaluate risk identify either pre-malignant lesions that are high grade or early cancers and remove them surgically. And this is what's called secondary prevention because you identify the abnormality or the presence of high-risk DNA, and then you evaluate whether it's high grade or, or low grade. If it's low grade, you just go back to, hopefully that'll go away spontaneously, if not reevaluate. If it's cancer, you treat vigorously if it's precancer, you do this ablative therapy where you just remove the cervix. This is a pretty complicated um, process, and it works in developed countries, but it really has not worked in the developing world. 85% of cervical cancers occur in the developing world because they can't get this going. So what we talk about most today is HPV prophylactic vaccines, which are what we call primary prevention, because it prevents the very initial step in this oncogenic process. Again, as I said, if you don't have HPV infection, you don't get cervical cancer. So in some ways, it's a much easier, much simpler paradigm for preventing cervical cancer. So what are the vaccines? So the vaccines are what we call virus-like particles, VLPs. And we actually, our group was responsible for developing this quite a few years ago now. And what we found is that if you just take this one gene, it's called L1, it's the major capsid protein, that was known at the time, and produce it in insect cells, it spontaneously assembles into something that for all the world looks like the outer shell of the virus. But importantly, it doesn't just look like the shell of the virus, but if you inject it initially into animals, what you get out is very high levels of antibodies that prevent infection by the authentic virus. But because you only are expressing this one structural protein and none of the oncoproteins, these vaccines are non-oncogenic and non-infectious. So they became a, a good platform to evaluate whether they could prevent the infections that cause cervical cancer. And to make a long story short, eventually three vaccines got developed and have been commercialized that vary somewhat in terms of their valency, how many types they have in them, and also their adjuvant and production system. So Cervarex is made by GlaxoSmithKline um, and it's made in insect cells and makes and has 16 and 18, which again are responsible for about 60, about 70% of cervical cancers and 90% of other cancers. It's made in insect cells, um, this, which was the production system we initially developed this vaccine in. 
me just sort of use the same one. And it has a, a fancy adjuvant, not just simple alum, aluminum salts adjuvant. It's the first, it activates a toll-like receptor, um, PLR4, for those who are immunologists. It's the first time this type, type of adjuvant has been approved for a prophylactic vaccine. So Merck developed a vaccine called Gardasil, which has these same two oncogenic types, but also type six and 11. Now they don't cause cancer, but they cause 90% of genital warts, okay? And so they included those types in it as well. And it's got a simple aluminum adjuvant. And more recently, they came up with a vaccine that in addition to these four types has the next five types that are associated with cancer, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. Other than that, it's basically on the same format. Um, and it turns out that now we used to have both of these vaccines, and now neither is available anymore in the United States. So if, if, if you have somebody, if you want to go get a HPV vaccine, you're going to get Cardacil 9, okay? Which in some ways is kind of seemingly the Cadillac, so it's not bad. Now, one thing, when you, if you think about um, devel deve developing cancer preventive measures, you're going to be in it for the long haul. These things take time to develop. And this is just, an, I think, an interesting timeline of the development of the va vaccine relative to our understanding of cervical cancer as being um, caused centrally by HPV infection. So the, the HPV-16, the type most associated with cancer, was discovered by Harold Zerhausen and his college back in 1982. It took us another 10 years before we developed this vaccine candidate. Um, and it took almost another 10 years to get the first report of efficacy. But importantly, during this time, there was a series of case control studies um, and prospective HPV neoplastic studies and also laboratory-based studies to, to understand the activity of the oncogenes which led at the time that the first clinical trials were initiated for the proposal that HPV was the first necessary cause of a cancer, in this case, cervical cancer. So the rationale for, for saying this vaccine could, could be a public health use was firmly established by the time we really got into the clinical trials. But the vaccine was first licensed in 2006 in, in, in women, just because the trials were started earlier um, for young women. Uh, and this was 15 years since we first discovered the VLPs. And this is in a situation where two of the very best companies that make vaccines, Merck and GlaxoSmithKline, were competing with each other to be at first in line. So you can see if, if you want to develop these interventions, you better be in it for the long haul. And actually right now I'm developing cancer therapies because I'm too old to develop a a new cancer prevention measure and actually see that it works and get it to make a public health impact. So now is a good time for you all to start doing cancer um, preventions. And it was licensed in men then three years later because the trials um, started a little bit later. So one of the important things is that, that we understood sort of the natural history of going from HPV infection to cancer was because we had to have um, a biomarker essentially as an endpoint in the clinical trials. We couldn't use cancer as an endpoint in clinical trials. If we had to use cancer for an endpoint, we wouldn't have this vaccine today. And the reason for that is twofold. One, the trials would have taken 20 years and hundreds of thousands of women because again, cancer is a very uncommon endpoint of infection that takes generally a long time to develop. And secondly, because we had screening, we couldn't let anybody go on to cancer because we would have to remove high-grade pre-malignant disease. But because we understood the natural history of this, that it progresses through these stages, we were able to use intermediate and high-grade dysplasias, which is the accepted precursor, at least especially this um, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grade three, as a precursor for invasive cancer, that the regulatory agencies were comfortable with the idea if we prevented this pre-malignant disease, we would prevent cancer. Now, some of us thought if since all the cancers are caused by, by HPV infection, we, don't, we should only have to show that we prevent infection. But there was a, an issue where people would say, well, what happens if you prevent 95% of, of HPV infections, but the 5% you don't 
prevent are the 5% that go on to cancer, okay? And we couldn't officially, you know, rule that possibility out. And so we had to use high-grade disease. And so the trials were actually quite, quite large, you know, 10 or 15,000 people for four years. And what those trials shows quite remarkably is, is at this time, there were no sexually transmitted disease vaccines that had even made an inkling of working well. And then what happened with this vaccine is that we basically got 100% efficacy against the most cancer proximal endpoint, the cervical intraepithelial grade three. This is a high grade dysplasia um, in the cervix and also extremely high protection um, against genital warts with Gardasil because it contains you know, the types that cause genital warts. But the two caveats is that it was 100% effective against the vaccine targeted type, okay? Not other types. And in women who didn't have the genital infections at entry. So in other words, this was strictly acting prophylactically. Now, to point out that this type that you'd be getting now with the additional nonavalent, the five extra types, basically can go from protection if type, type protection is type specific from about 70% to almost 80, almost 90% of the types that cause cervical cancer. And the reason, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually skip ahead one. And the reason that, that they did this is because they don't prevent infection or disease caused by most of the other types that cause cervical cancer. So they're what we call type restricted. The vaccines will, there's a few types related to 16, 18 that are very closely related that will get partial protection the ones that are farther out evolutionarily, we don't get any protection. Um, and the other thing is they don't induce regression of lesions once they're established or prevent progression if you already have an infection. So what about other diseases? So for, for cervical, we definitely know that it prevents infection of the cervix and also the induction of interepithelial neoplasia. I just showed you that data for SYN3. For anal infection, we also know that it prevents prevents both infection and dysplasias, and same for vulvar vaginal. For penile infection, for, for the penile lesions, we know that it prevents infection, but this is actually relatively uncommon that even the pre-malignant disease doesn't come up very often, and the trials weren't big enough to actually show statistically significant protection from um, interepithelial neoplasia. And for oral pharynx, we have some data that it protects against oral HPV carriage. But the reason I have a question mark there is we don't know whether the samples that we're gathering are actually on the causal pathway to getting cancers. You know, they may be infection at other sites that have no predilection to have cancer. And we don't know what the precursor lesions are for oral pharyngeal cancer. So there's no, we have no way of knowing whether we're preventing them or not. So we think that this is really a remarkable vaccine and that it really induces it prevents um, sterilizing immunity since most vaccine vaccinees never test positive for HPV infection, even when we use sensitive PCR uh, assays. And when we do see what look like breakthrough infections, we see them early, okay, in the first six months or a year after somebody's vaccinated. So what could that mean? Why wouldn't we see them later after immunity would tend to, tend to wane? What we think is happening is that those people already are infected. And what's happening is we, we missed it when we sampled it, even by sensitive PCR. And so that we're, these, these infections are emerging soon after the person is infected. So it's actually a prevalent infection. It's not a new infection. And then the vaccines actually work much better in year five, six, seven, eight, or nine than it does in year one or two, okay? So the results are that we're really getting our sterilizing immunity, um, presumably by the induction of neutralizing antibodies. I'll show you some data on that in a minute. Went over that. So despite what you can read <laughs> by Googling HPV safety on the internet, these are actually pretty darn safe vaccines, okay? There's, there's a lot of disinformation about the HPV vaccine and, and other vaccines in terms of safety from the anti-vaxxers. But what we mainly see is low-grade transient injection site reaction, um, particularly pain or common, but that's just because of the needle stick. 
also, it, the, the, the vaccine is, is hypertonic. So it's got a little bit higher salt than normal, so it kind of stings, but it goes away very rapidly. Um, if there are systemic reactions, they're normally mild and self-limiting. There is fainting that occurs in some people, but that's, that's basically just because you're getting a needle stick. Um, it's got nothing to do with what's being injected, but it's important in this adolescent group, this actually can happen that if you vaccinate somebody, they need to sit down for a little while to make sure you don't get, you don't get people fainting, because that actually can, you can break your teeth, all sorts of problems. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. It's definitely a side effect of the process. But if you look in the control trials at serious adverse events, you can see that for either Gardasil or Cervix, there's really no difference in the rate of serious adverse events. And post-licensure, there's been pretty strong post-licensure surveillance of populations where a lot of the women are getting vaccinated or girls are getting vaccinated and boys. And there's no, there's no signal that there's an increase in any particular like autoimmune disease or anything in the vaccinees versus the unvaccinated. And there's been you know tens of millions of doses delivered so far. So it really looks like a, an exceptionally safe vaccine. And, but this should actually be accept, expected because it's not a live virus. It's just one protein, it's a protein shell, okay? It's really kind of no difference in that regard from tetanus. And in terms of, um, so in, in vaccinology, I think we want to realize that we talk about two different things. We talk about efficacy, and that means what happens in a clinical trial, and then effectiveness, which means how good does it work in, in, a, in a vaccination program out in the public? And so once it was licensed, we've now been able to do more and more effectiveness trials to see how this is really working in, in the real world, um, not under control conditions. I'm just going to show you a, a couple bits of data. So just recently, the data in the United States was published in terms of the prevalence of HPV of the types that are targeted by the vaccine in the United States in young, young women this age, 20 to 24, 25 to 29. And what you can see is that pre-vaccination, it was vaccination started about 2007 here, that the rate was about 13%. Um, in vaccinated, in this last year where they had the data, it's dropped 90%, okay? So this is really working well. And even in the unvaccinated, it's dropped over half, almost two thirds. So one thing about sexually transmitted disease vaccines, and this actually could, could be predicted, is that there's really strong herd immunity. So you really can get protection for people who aren't vaccinated relatively rapidly um, with these types of vaccines. There's much less of an effect in these older women. Why is that? For two reasons. Fewer of them have gotten vaccinated and more of them already had their infections before they got vaccinated, okay? But we do see a trend here as well. And this is just a composite data for intermediate and high-grade dysplasias from countries that have at least 50% coverage. And years since, this is the year since they started vaccination, you can see that in the youngest age group, which are mostly been more have been vaccinated and more likely to not have been exposed before vaccination, we see a very sharp trend. And same with women 20 to 24, although it starts a little bit later. But these older women who mostly are not being vaccinated or have already have been infected, you can see there's no change whatsoever. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to, to shout them out, but say them loud. And what about cancer? It just, it, we're just starting to see, again, you know, most cancers take 20 years to develop on average, but we're starting to see a, a downward trend in the incidence of cervical cancer in the United States. Barely believable, but there's an inflection point that happened about three years or four years after the introduction, at least in, in the youngest age women, not in the older women, where it looks like we're starting to see a downward trend. So stay tuned, hopefully in the next 10 years, this is gonna be entirely clear and we're really gonna see a large increase in the reduction in cervical cancer among the younger cohorts who are already vaccinated. So one thing, I think we have to stop thinking about this vaccine as a new kid in the block. People are saying, oh, I still don't wanna take this vaccine. It's kind of, kind of experimental. We just kind of, you know, kind of getting the use, use of this. And, but it's actually not true because it's been commercially available for more than 10 years. It's licensed in more than, I think, it's, I think this is old. This, it's now it's more than 100 countries. 
Um, over 300 million doses have been given globally. And as I've shown you, that we're really seeing increased effectiveness on the national, um, in immuniz national immunization programs and a continuing strong safety record. So there really is no reason for people to hesitate to take this vaccine, even though there is a, a fair amount of vaccine hesitancy in the United States. So what is the potential impact of this vaccine globally? So fairly recently, some people came up with this number and it's a little complicated, but what this shows is that in the age cohorts that were, could potentially have been vaccinated from the time that the vaccine was introduced to the present, over the next 65 years, those women are, would, with no vaccine, would get 19 million cases of cancer and 10 million deaths. So that's the potential impact of the vaccine. But they also then they estimated how many of those deaths, and how many of those cases have actually pre been prevented by the program over the last 10 years. You can maybe think in your head what the numbers would be. And it's actually very disappointing on one level because so far they've estimated we've only prevented 365,000 cases and about 150,000 deaths. Now, there, you can look at that half full or half empty because if, if you came to me and said, you know, John, we, we just cured 150,000 ladies of cancer, you'd say, hey, that's, that's a pretty good deal, okay? But again, the difference between treatment and prevention is prevention, the people who don't get cancer, it, it's silent. They don't know who they are. And so they tend to be underappreciated. And the other way to look at it is that, yeah, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good number, but the potential is so much larger than what it is. So, and, and, and the reason for this is, is just who's getting vaccinated. So if you look at where, the, where the, the cases have been prevented, it's almost all in high or upper middle income countries. And again, the reason for this is that in the lower middle income and lower income countries, the vaccine just hasn't penetrated. They're just not getting the vaccine. And even in the United States, the vaccine is, is horribly underutilized. So if you look at, this is data through 2015, if you look at in the same age group, adolescents, they get a dose of, of tetanus, diphtheria, a, a cellular pertussis, or meningococcal vaccine, that the rate at which they even get one dose of the HPV vaccine is much less. And the rate in which they get three doses, which, which in that case was, was the prescribed amount, is, is much less. Um, and this is the latest data uh, that the CDC just published a few weeks ago, where complete the series, and something I forgot to mention is that uh, after introduction about six years ago, five years ago, they found that if you're under 15 and you only get two doses at zero and six months, you respond as well in terms of antibody response as if you get three doses and you're over 15. And so now most countries, if you're under 15, you just get two doses at zero, six months. If you're over 15, you get three doses at zero, one or two months, and then six months. So it's called prime, prime boost. Um, and so the complete the series is 54%. And for boys, it's actually creeping up quite close, um, that it, it's getting close to what it is for girls. At least one dose is 70%, and for boys, 66%. And quite frankly, for I'll show you in a minute, this is what I look at. I look at the one dose because I think this is gonna be the first subunit vaccine that's gonna be effective by, for, for, with only one dose. And I'll show you this in a minute. So how are we gonna increase uptake, particularly in low resource settings? With both com companies are committed for sale for Gavi, which buys vaccines for the 72 lowest income countries in, in the world um, for less than $5 a dose, which is a heck of a lot less than, than about $175 a dose we pay in the United States because we have this inefficient healthcare system. In Latin America, PAHO buys it for about $15 a dose. Um, we're working with vaccine manufacturers in emerging countries, uh, particularly in, in China and in India. And I'm happy to say um, one company in China has completed their phase three trials and they submitted it for regulatory approval. And it's likely to be approved within the next year. They had very high efficacy even against the you know, this in two, three high-grade dysplasia endpoint. 
An another thing we need to do, as I mentioned, is, is address vaccine hesitancy by educating pro programs aimed at families, particularly healthcare providers. There's still a lot of hesitancy among providers to strongly recommend the vaccine. They basically say, okay, roll up your arm, it's time for your DTAP. They say, oh, there's also this HPV. Do you wanna talk about it? Maybe you should consider this. And what they, what they really need to do is just say, you know, roll up your arm, here are these two vaccines, you're just gonna get both of them. And sometimes they think they, they talk about it too much or they, you know, they have kind of this hesitancy. Um, and then the thing that we think is really gonna be a game changer is if we can turn this into a single dose vaccination program. And I'll show you. And the reason why we think this, this is possible came out of um, what we call post hoc analysis of a trial uh, of Cervarex, the bivalent vaccine that was occurring in, in Costa Rica that the NCI sponsored. It was the only trial that wasn't sponsored by a company of this, these vaccines. And unlike the companies, we didn't just look at, at the per protocol. In other words, the people who got th three doses, we looked at the girls who got just one dose or two doses. And come to find out if you get one dose, and this is now data after seven years, and we have comparable data after 11 years, that's not been published yet. Um, where if you look at, at the number of cases, the incident infections by HPV 16, there's no difference. The confidence intervals completely overlap. They're wider for this because we have fewer people. Everybody was supposed to get three doses, but some of them, women for various reasons only got one dose, but we continued to follow them. And if you look at, these are the types where you get some cross protection, you can see that there's equal amounts of cross protection. Very importantly, if you look at the non-oncogenic and oncogenic types where you don't see any protection at all, there's a high rate of incident infection and it's equal in the two groups. So what this says is that the girls who are only getting one dose don't have differential risk of, of genital HPV infection, okay? So we think there isn't a bias, a selection bias for women who are gonna have less risky behaviors. Um, and there's actually been then, since we, we published that, uh, another trial of, of Cervarex that have, have looked and they basically found again, showing similar efficacy after one, three, one, two, and three doses. We were concerned that, that maybe one dose would work for Cervarex because it had this special high potency ad, adjuvant. But more and more, it's looking like Gardasil, which has just a simple aluminum salts adjuvant, also protects by one, one dose. Because in India, they, they started this, this, what was gonna be a cluster randomized trial where they're gonna give half the villages two doses and half the villages three doses. But for, for reasons unrelated to this trial, these trials got stopped by the Indian government. So they had some areas where they only got one dose. They were able to compare one, two, and three doses. Although again, it wasn't randomized to that. And they basically, again, have seen similar protection over seven years. So I think one dose is gonna work, but the problem is national regulators <laughs> aren't gonna be convinced by this data because it wasn't in a randomized trial. They're gonna want much more solid data than something that comes out of this post hoc analysis where they're always concerned about bias as much as you can try to explain it away. Um, so we don't think that it's time yet for a single dose program. Although we think these, these results are encouraging enough for potentially early adoption in low resource settings um, with a contingency plan that if it turns out it doesn't work, they could then boost. And when, how would we find out that it doesn't work? Well, again, we, the NCI has taken it upon ourselves with help from the Gates Foundation to formally evaluate whether one dose is enough. And this is sort of the outline of the trial where it's gonna be a forearm trial. Where we're gonna compare one dose versus two doses of the Cervarex, the bivalent vaccine, and one, two doses of Gardasil 9, 5,000 young women. Um, the primary endpoint is persistent HPV infection. We chose this age because most of them are likely to be um, sexually naive before the start of the trial, then many of them will transition and to become sexually active over the next four years of the, of the trial. Um, and as I said, this is an NCI Gates Foundation. So in the four or five years in, in 2024 or 25, we think we'll have the definitive information as to whether one dose is enough. Now, one of the reasons why it's critical to do this is, is something that, you know, is really disappointing is that there's, there's currently a vaccine shortage. 
Merck basically said that they would have plenty of vaccine to supply the world, and it just turns out it wasn't true. Um, and so that the estimate is, is that over the next five years, about a third of the demand in middle and lower income countries will not be met. So there'll be demand for the vaccine. We want the vaccine to vaccinate our girls, but there won't be any vaccine to give them. And the reason for this is really multifactorial. Demand has been stronger um, and uptake higher in these middle and lower income countries than what's been anticipated. So unlike the United States, where there's a lot of hesitancy. A lot of some of these countries, these lower income countries that started up, like you want Rwanda, they're at 80 percent, 90 percent the first year and continue to have high rates of uptake. Another thing is that that many countries in WHO has recommended this is to start a multi age cohort at introduction. So eventually they'll vaccinate just 10 year olds, but they don't want to miss that next age, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds, because then you'll never get them because they'll become sexually active and the vaccine won't help them very much. And so they're recommending that when you first introduce, you do this campaign to vaccinate more age groups. Well, of course, that takes more vaccine. Another thing is that more countries are adopting general neutral vaccination programs. Originally, everybody was thinking just girls. And like the United States, now we vaccinate boys. And for instance, Great Britain has just decided they were going to start vaccinating boys. Well, that's going to be a huge amount more vaccine. Um, and lastly, we're, you know, we're transitioning from Gardasil 4 to Gardasil 9, which has five more HPV types. Well, that takes extra manufacturing capacity, 2.5 times more to make one dose. And so that's, you know, the vaccine doesn't go as far or the manufacturing cap capacity doesn't go as far. So to, to mitigate this shortage, um, one of the things we're talking about, I'm on an WHO working group um, that we're working through is, is to delay delivery of the second dose. For most vaccines, if you delay the second dose, you actually get a stronger response than if you give it fairly soon. And the reason for that is if you do it fairly soon, you have quite high levels of antibodies circulating. And then when you put that antigen in, it, those antibodies that are pre-existing are going to bind your antigen, and it's never going to get to the B cells to activate them. Okay. So if you wait a year, two years, three years, five years, if anything, you're going to get a better response. And so we think that it'd probably be fine to delay. And if you vaccinate a 10 year old, now vaccinate her at 14 or 15, you're still probably going to catch her before she becomes sexually active. Um, it would be, it'd be useful to temporarily curtail new introduction of male vaccination in mid adult programs. And I must say, I'm really disappointed that um, the CDC, their advisory committee, recently. Um, adopted vaccination of mid-adult men and women up to age 45. Because using the vaccine to vaccinate a 40-year-old guy in the United States who has a relatively low, a very low chance of getting an HPV vaccine that's going to cause him a cancer and kill him, um, or a woman to get a cervical cancer and have her die, versus using that vaccine for a 12-year-old girl in South Sahara, Sub-Saharan Africa, where she has a chance of having HIV infection and really having a very high risk. If she does get cervical cancer, she's not going to have palliative care. She's not going to have treatment. To use the vaccine for this, I think, is a travesty. And I'm dead set against it. Um, you have a question in the back. The question, why was this particular age range, 45? And it's very simple that that's the age in which the trials ended. So when they did the clinical trials to show that it actually prevented infection, they stopped at, at age 45. <clears throat> and so you can't get, usually get approval for older ages than what you've actually done trials in. Um, so obviously another thing is to delay transition from G4 to G9 and, and again, facilitate generic vaccine production and licensure in middle income countries. So we're trying to do everything we can to build up the supply by having these countries like China and, and, and India and Brazil make vaccine that can sell it to the rest of the world. So <clears throat> I'm going to sort of switch gears here now and get into immunology and virology, which is actually more what I do. I'm not really a public health guy, so I just sort of learned all this stuff because I'm a laboratory guy, so I, that's the kind of research I do. And so, you know, this is, the, as I mentioned, the first vaccine to work um, to prevent sexually transmitted disease 
and it works extremely, extremely well. It's the first vaccine, subunit vaccine that we think is gonna work by one dose. So it's been really interesting to me to try to figure out why this vaccine works so unexpectedly well. We didn't know this going in, and there's really three reasons for this. One is that the vaccines are exceptionally good at inducing neutralizing antibodies. I'll tell you why we think that is. Secondly, the infectious mechanism that HPVs use make them exceptionally susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. I'll tell you why that is. And finally, this is just basic biology, is HPVs have DNA genomes. And so they don't evolve rapidly to evade neutralizing antibodies. They're not like HIV or hepatitis C, where they're actually replicating as a swarm, even with, in one individual. There's all these different variants that it's very hard to ever get a handle on. You know, it's, they're constantly evolving. Um, and, and these don't evolve at the same rate. And kind of one of the important things of understanding why this is exceptional is it provides biological plausibility of why these VLPs may be the first subunit of vaccine to induce long-term protection after a single dose. So first of all, the, the remarkable thing is that after three doses, this came out of the initial trial, is that almost everybody responds. For instance, if you look at the hepatitis B vaccine, there's a fair number of people who don't respond even after three doses. Here, it's 100% to a rounding error. This is just one example of data. And secondly, is if you look long term, the titers peak a few months or a month after the last dose, and then they de decline relatively rapidly, and then they flatten out, especially at the younger ages. So essentially, between about year two or three and year 10, as long as we've looked, they don't change. They've actually just completely flattened out. And so what that means is that they're inducing what we call long-lived plasma cells which are, are B cells that migrate mostly to the bone marrow and pump out antibodies indefinitely, presumably in the absence of re-exposure to antigen. And so these vaccines are exceptionally good at doing that. So why is that? Well, and the, the, the most remarkable thing is that even after a single dose, so this is between year two and year 11, this is unpublished data yet, as you can see that for one dose, there's absolutely no change in the antibody titers in these women, okay? And if, if you look at the difference between one dose in, in, four, in three doses, the difference long-term is only fourfold. So they're actually approaching the same plateau. And it's almost as you do more doses, it's just sort of additive. And so the question is, is that fourfold difference gonna make a difference? It's really not much difference. But if you look in comparison to the response to natural infection, which again, this virus, as I said earlier, is a tricky virus, so it doesn't induce immune responses very much because its whole life cycle is in the stratified squamous epithelia and the virions are shed to the outside. Um, so it's kind of a straw man to be better than, but even with one dose after 11 years, we're 11 fold higher than what we see after natural infection. Okay, or nine fold higher. So the reason we think that these are such good vaccines is basically the structure of the antigen. So unlike most vaccines like tetanus, which is a simple subunit, okay, one or a few copies, these things have a very regularly highly rigid structure with repetitive elements. And what we think happens is that since these types of antigens mimic much more the proteins that are normally floating around in our body, they're not intrinsically immunogenic. And so that even if they're foreign, you get weak activation signals, low antibody levels that tend to go away. Whereas these structures are particularly recognized as foreign or dangerous. And what happens is these are the B cell receptors, which are just antibodies that are on the cell surface of the B cell. And when they get cross-linked, you get signaling through the types of tyrosine kinases that, that Terry talked about, they're distinct, but you get very strong signals that signal proliferation, survival, and induction of high antibodies and for a long period, for essentially the rest of your life. So they actually mimic, these structures mimic more of the type of responses you see against a real virus infection. So if you have a measles infection, and you come back, uh, there was a, a case where there was a measles infection on an island, and there wasn't a measles infection on that island for another 40 years or whatever it is, I don't remember exactly, 
but they came, but they checked, and those people still had high tit had reasonable titers of measles. Okay, people used to think it was had had to do with the fact that it was a real infection, but it's probably because the measles virus also has this real structure, and simple subunit vaccines don't. And so we think that be and it's interesting. So about the time that we were developing the HPV vaccines, these virus-like particles, and the reason we did it is because we need, knew we needed to have confirmationally correct epitopes. Because if you denature the protein, you didn't get anything, okay? You didn't get any neutralizing antibodies. You got antibodies, but they weren't neutralizing. But at the same time, in 1993, Bachman and Zinkernagel came up with this idea that B cells specifically recognize particulate antigens with spacings at a very specific spacing of 50 to 100 angstroms as foreign. Because this is the epitope spacing that's, found, that's generally found on microbial surfaces like the, the virion capsid proteins, like the HPV, or for instance on bacteria pili. But these complexes are rarely found, or actually not found, on the mammalian body that's exposed to systemic immunity. And so the B cell receptor is essentially evolved as an antigen-specific pattern recognition receptor. We really think that this is the key for inducing high levels of antibodies to this vaccine. It may well be the key for future vaccines, for instance, an HIV vaccine, where you also want to get 100% responses and durable responses indefinitely. So the other thing has to do with the basic virology, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to go into this, but the bottom line is that this virus is the slowest infecting virus that anybody's ever come up with, okay? It takes forever to infect. Most viruses, when they hit their cell surfaces, within minutes, they're inside and not susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. So what we were able to find out over the years is that in a mouse cervical vaginal challenge model, the specifics aren't so important, but that initially it can't even bind cell surfaces. It has to bind to the basement membrane at areas of trauma to specifically modified forms of heparin sulfate uh, proteoglycans that then induce conformational changes um, exposure to proteases, further conformational changes, and only at, then after all that occurs, can it even bind the primary keratinocytes that it wants to infect. And once it's on the surface of the cell, it still takes hours to get in. So what you can imagine, if you have antibodies floating around here, there's a ton of time for, they, for them to act, okay? And it also cuts us a real break in terms of the, the levels of antibodies that are gonna be able to interact with the virus. Because when we first were developing this vaccine, we thought, well, you know, most people say, when you do systemic vaccination, you generate systemic antibodies, but not much mucosal antibodies, which is mostly IgA, okay? And this, we thought that the cervix is, is, we would get protection because at the cervix, it's an unusual tissue and that there's transudation of IgG, okay, by what's called the, the neonatal FC receptor. And there's very few places on mucosal surfaces where this occurs. In the female genital tract, in the lower respiratory tract, this occurs. It's the same receptor that pumps antibodies across the placenta from the mother to the fetus. But we thought that that could maybe protect, but the problem is if you look at the, the levels of these transudated serum antibodies um, in, the, in the cervical vaginal mucus, they're 10 to 100 fold less than what's in the serum. But now when you think about the, what happens, because the virus needs to bind this basement membrane, it's gonna have come in contact with exudation of interstitial and capillary antibodies at this site of infection. And so the virus is gonna be coming, trying to get down here to this basement membrane against a gradient of antibodies that are gonna be oozed out at that microtrauma that's almost gonna reach the level of what's in, in the serum. And we actually know that this mechanism, this exudation must work for this vaccine because we get very strong protection against genital warts and many of them come on, 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 on genital surfaces that aren't, aren't bathed in mucus, for instance, the, the male genitalia, okay? And so we, we must be getting enough protection just from this exudation process. And so again, I think we really got cut a break um, in terms of how the virus infects. So one of the questions I'm just about done is are the plateau titers after vaccination near the minimum needed for protection? Remember I said there was this fourfold difference between one dose and, and, four, and three doses? Is that gonna be the critical amount? So we try to get at this by, by doing what we call the passive transfer experiment where, um, so what we did is, is we, have a, we have a mouse cervical vaginal challenge assay, which I haven't shown you, 
But basically what you do is, is, is have um, what we call HPV pseudoviruses, like HPV-16 pseudoviruses that express luciferase. And so if you get infection, you, you get light exposed. If you don't, you don't get light. And you do intravaginal delivery of this vaccine of, this, of these viruses in animals that have been lightly traumatized. And so what we did is we vaccinated a rabbit with the, with the VLPs and then diluted the sera from the rabbit and transferred it into a mouse at various concentrations. And we asked, well, how much sera, how much can you dilute that sera and still get protection? If you could only dilute it twofold, well, that means, well, then that rabbit was sort of close to the edge of where you could get protection, okay? If you could dilute it a hundredfold, that means we're way over the level of protection. And this was actually the, probably the most astounding research finding I think we've ever, we've ever had. So I won't make you guess as to, as to how much you could dilute the serum and still get protection because you're gonna be wrong. So what we found is that you could dilute it even 10,000 fold and still get strong protection from cervical vaginal challenge. So that basically means that that rabbit had 10,000 times more sera or 10 times higher levels of antibodies circulating than it needed to, for protection from cervical vaginal challenge. Now, mice and people have about 10 times lower antibodies than, than rabbits. So we'd expect for translate to people, it'd only be a thousand times too much, but that's a lot different than four, fourfold. Um, and so one of the things that we also then did is, is looked at the mechanism of protection from experimental challenge. How, how is it preventing infection at a, at a, a low dilution, only a hundred fold versus this 10,000 fold? And what we found was that at high levels of antibodies, the virus never bound to the basement membrane to these HSPGs because we were basically coating the antibody and not letting it bind. But at low levels, we actually got binding to the basement membrane, but we never got infection or transferred cells because we think that these, hand, these antibodies at lower levels binding these still serve as handlebars so they get gobbled up by neutrophils and macrophages, which are also going to be attracted to these sites of, an, of trauma, okay? So again, it's another mechanism why this is working so well. So to conclude, the HPV vaccines are very effective at preventing incident infection disease by the vaccine types because they're exceptionally potent inducers of neutralizing antibodies and also because the virus is really susceptible to inhibition by antibodies. And so this means that the vaccine has great potential for reducing the burden of HPV-induced cancers worldwide. And the primary challenge now is to see that the vaccine reaches the individuals who need it the most, particularly young women in areas that aren't gonna be screened. And demonstrating sustained efficacy in the single dose in a randomized control, control trial, we think can really transform implementation programs. Oops. Shoot, I think I got the wrong. Okay. I think I loaded the wrong one. So what I want to just conclude is that something that, that maybe you don't know about, but, but the, Dr. Tedros, the Inspector General of the WHO, based upon the promise of this vaccine and also screening, has declared the goal to eliminate cervical cancer in the next 50 years. And so I think this is really a remarkable that one could even propose that a cancer, a major cancer, in humans can be eliminated with the tools that we currently have. And I can't think of any other cancer where we have the tools in hand to completely eliminate it. And it's really about political will and spending the money and getting the vaccine and, and screening to, to the people who need it. And, but, it's, but it's also encouraging that it's all based upon this bio, biomolecular research enterprise that have came up with these tools in this fundamental understanding that HPV is a central cause of cervical cancer that allows us to even be so bold as proposed to eliminate this cancer. So thank you. Questions? So if the vaccine is so good, could it work for the women? Probably, but the, the problem with, the problem with that is, is it hasn't gone through clinical trials. And so you can never use something off-label. No one would use it off-label. 
it's, it's quite likely that, that, yeah, you could use half doses and make it go twice as far. But the companies could, could never do that unless there was FDA approval or regulatory approval. And they wouldn't do that unless there was clinical trials, okay? Because now there's some thought that, that if you have a vaccine that has what's called uh, immunological non-inferiority, in other words, gets the same antibody levels, you could get it approved. But if you reduce the dose, you're gonna get less antibodies, okay? We, we, I think there still would be plenty to, to prevent infection based upon our animal data, but you'll never convince regulators to say, you know, oh yeah, we believe that and it's gonna work. Hurt the loose money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, so the data is, you know, again, it varies a little bit, but that within two years, 90% of, of women have cleared, okay? So the vast majority clear. And it's believed generally, if you clear, you're probably cleared by an immunological mechanism and, you, and you're protected from reinfection by that specific type. But it doesn't carry over to, to protection from other types. It seems like each of these types is independent. So you can gain one type and lose one type and they don't seem to be cross-inhibited. Cross so the protection that, that you're, that's generated is type specific. There's a little bit of, of wiggle room because you can get um, latent infection and reactivation. So it may, it may look like you're getting reinfected by the same type, but you can't really distinguish that between it just sort of lying low and then getting reactivated. We know that this can occur, for instance, in pregnant women, like pre pregnant women will have reactivation of genital warts that they had you know, many years ago and hadn't seen it for a long time. They get it at the same spot, okay? And so we do, we do know that that latency can occur, but how much it occurs and, and what role it has in cancer risk is not very clear, okay? So, okay. Thank you.